Hey guys, welcome to the Gorilla Podcast. This is Brian Pinamani. I'm joined by my good friend Kendall Gammon today. How you doing tonight, Kendall? I am good. How you doing, Brian? Fantastic. I'm glad we could finally get together. I know we've been trying for a couple weeks. Yep. Um, we've been playing a lot of tag to try to, to get this thing to come out. And I had a little internet problem the other night, so we right. got it we got it resolved. So that was a good thing. So anyway, I, I want to welcome you to the Gorilla Mafia Podcast. And just a little background on Kendall. For those of you who don't know, Kendall uh, was a teammate of mine on the 1991 National Championship team and then went on to have a stellar career in the NFL of 15 years. Had four years with the Steelers, four with the New Orleans Saints, and seven with the Chiefs. What a wonderful guest to have on tonight. We had Troy Wilson on the episode last time. Troy played on the 94 Super Bowl team with the 49ers, and, and Kendall was fortunate enough to be on the Steelers 95 team the year right after that, which is kind of awesome to have two of our former players play in back-to-back Super Bowls. How was that feeling playing in a, a Super Bowl in 1995 with the Steelers? Yeah, it, it was fabulous. And first, first and foremost, thanks for having me on and thinking of me. But um, it was. It was neat uh, for so many different reasons, the one being the fact that we got back because the year before, we thought it was going to be a matchup between myself and, and Troy because the Steelers were in the AFC Championship game. We lost on the last play of the game uh, against the uh, Chargers, and so we didn't get to meet there. And I don't think I've ever been so disappointed in my life with that. But getting back that next year was huge. And, of course, we ended up uh, losing to the Cowboys, unfortunately, so it's still too soon to talk about. But uh, <laughs> all the same, uh, you know, I have to pinch myself. I was very fortunate, right place, the right time. And uh, just, you know, like, like a lot of us, you, know, you as, as well, you know, you take advantage of your opportunities and what pre- is presented to you. Absolutely. I, I mean, it's just to me, it just I always love seeing success of former players that we played with and and watching you two guys play in the NFL and we had other players that played in the NFL as well, Ron Moore, Ronnie West, Mm -hmm. fantastic. But to be able to, to go from a college championship team to then play a couple years later in a Super Bowl is just fantastic. And and I can't imagine the, the hoopla and just the, the energy that surrounds that whole week of playing in a Super Bowl. I mean, how exciting was that for you, your family, the team? I mean, was that just, is that just crazy? Yeah, it is. It, it's it's really surreal, Brian. I mean, um, you know, you, you have a couple of weeks between the AFC Championship or the NFC Championship and the Super Bowl. And honestly, I don't know how they used to do it in, in one week because there's so much going on. you got to put the game plan in. You've got to go there a week, week early because you've got uh, media obligations, at least those who talk to the media that much. Myself being a long snapper, I didn't. But uh, all the same, um, you had to be available for it. But uh, it was crazy. I mean, I remember being on the field uh, pregame, uh, snapping, and you know they they bring you know they bring legends out there for the the snap and or for the uh, the, the coin toss. And you know Joe Joe Namath, who's an AFC guy with the Jets, he's walking out there and he just happens to walk by me and says, "Hey, let, let's get a win today." And I'm just like, "No way, Joe Namath just said anything to me, let alone let's get a win." But um, it, it's crazy. I mean, uh, I, like I said. Um, it was amazing. It was a great experience. And, and a lot of people might not realize this, but a lot of my success, I think a lot of our success comes from, quite honestly, playing at Pittsburgh State, where we win a national championship, where we win so much and we expect that. And that, that goes into the mindset that I think helped keep me in the NFL, certainly the mindset that got me there. Absolutely. And, we, you know, Troy and I were talking about that same thing. I mean, winning teams like his 49ers teams, your Steelers teams, our Gorilla team, mm-hmm. you know, it was a team. And I think that that, and I'm sure that you saw the same type of relationships at those winning organizations when you played with them, you know, the ones that were very successful had a really tight knit group of people that were friends and, you know, colleagues on and off the field. And I mean, would, would you agree that those winning teams share that same type of bond? If you will. Yeah. you, You said it really well, which is generally your teams, um, that are the best teams do have that that tight locker room, like you mentioned. Certainly in the NFL, with the exception of four or five teams, I think most teams have a a, a fairly level sense of of uh, I guess skill on the team. But it's the teams that are led the right way and they have that that very tight locker room. Now uh, we had that also at Pittsburgh State, but quite honestly. Uh, I, I think we had players in that locker room, you, myself, Ronald Moore, and it goes on and on and on that were that 
I don't know if we were overlooked. We might have been overplayed at a higher level, but we were where we were. We liked it. And we just – we had some exceptional players. That was a team that was pretty special. I think we not only outcoached people and we were tight, but we – as a team, uh, skill level wise, I think we were above most that we played. I agree with that completely. And I think a lot of that was just the, the amount of hours that we put in together, whether it was mm-hmm. film or on the field and, and that bond. Cause you know, we all had opportunities to play at other, at other schools. And ultimately when, when I was recruited, it came down to, you know, Franchoni recruited me and, and it was being a part of that organization. And he really spelled out kind of, what the plan was for four right. years and, and seeing the people that were coming in, mm-hmm. it just was a great fit because we had a lot of great people. And I think that's what makes winning organizations win and are successful. And for you being, you know, playing for with the Steelers and then with the saints ending your career, seven years with Kansas city, and then spending another 12 years in Kansas city broadcasting with them, you know, You've seen a lot of teams, especially the Super Bowl team at Pittsburgh, ending with the Chiefs. Now the Chiefs with their dynasty that they're creating going forward. Right. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts on, you know, how that leadership changed with the Chiefs. Because, you know, you were with them for almost 20 years. Um, yeah. How, how was that? Tra- how did you, you know, you witnessed that firsthand. Give me an insight as to how you saw that whole organization change from where when you were there and even in the 80s when they were just kind of very mediocre at best to this dynasty that is is happening right now well it's a great question i'll go back to pittsburgh first because when i was with the steelers as coach cower who was a rookie uh head coach the youngest head coach at the time when he started which was when i was drafted also and of course he came from kansas city he was a defensive coordinator there but uh, the first couple of years, we did pretty well with him. And then the next uh, year, he brought in Kevin Green, who was an eventual uh, Pro Football Hall of Famer. And you're talking about bringing people in there that just, I, I think, glue the team together, these leaders that really get it going uh, and that ignite things. And I think he was one of those guys that takes a leader to really recognize that. Now, you know, pushing over to Kansas City, my years there, Gunther Cunningham's who brought me to Kansas City, and he he was he was a fine coach, but you know what? Um, he he just he was a better general. I mean, he was he was just a better coordinator than he was actually a head coach. And of course, then I had the the good fortune to play for Coach uh, Dick Ramil, and he's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame as well. Um, and my last year with Herm Edwards. But as you mentioned, after my career, uh, twelve years at the Chiefs Radio Network. So I broadcast the first seven years of Big Red. Uh, Andy Reid, his career, of course, he's a first ballot Hall of Famer, three uh, trophies to his name right now. And there's more coming, I think, in this dynasty that you mentioned. Um, but I, I think when you when you look at it, you have to have the skill level. But I think it's more so with the leadership of creating that bond, helping make people better than they are, creating a mindset with them. And, and, and you mentioned Francioni. Francioni wasn't the easiest guy to play for, but uh, I mean, he and I, I wouldn't say, I mean, I don't know if we were oil and water, but it was something like that. And, and he and I weren't the only ones that he had that. And I remember, you probably remember the saying, which is, he said, I don't care if you play for me or in spite of me, as long as you play. Right. And I've used that a lot because it is what it is. You're trying to, to ignite somebody and motivate them in, in some fashion. And I think that's what we saw at the college level. I saw it at the Steelers and then take it to the Chiefs. Certainly Andy Reid, what he did come in and, and just did a great job, uh, but not quite getting over the hump, even though he's taking teams to the uh, the playoffs each and every year. But again, as we see now in this dynasty, and it is a dynasty right now, um, when you look at Mahomes and Kelsey and that locker room, and I've had the good fortune to interview both. Um, you know, honestly, I don't know if they would remember my name, but they would remember me because I was around them a fair amount. Sure, and sure. Uh, these guys, uh, they're amazing. I mean, when you look at Patrick Mahomes, um, it's real. It's authentic. Everything you see, I have a little story. I was the first one to interview him in the locker room after his first start, which was the last game of his rookie season when they rested off Smith because the playoffs were taken care of and the, and the seating and everything. And we won that game in dramatic fashion. And I interview him after the game. And on my recorder, there's a fell sound thing where you have to hit the record button twice. I've never messed it up in my life, but I just happened to that time. I'm walking away from a great interview and I realize 
uh, that I didn't get anything. I'm like, mother, I was just like, <laughs> and so I have to, I have to tuck tail, turn and go back to him. I tell him what happened. I said, can I just ask you a couple questions? So I at least got something. And literally he just looked at me, he goes, no, Kim, let's just, let's just do the whole thing over again. And so we did, and he didn't have to do that, but he did. And he still would today because that's the kind of person he is. And the people around him, they gravitate to that. They understand that. I mean, each and every year, uh, Coach Reed allows the ambassadors, the former chiefs, to come to camp. And then we come down on the field afterwards, and we all say hello to the team, introduce ourselves and everything. And then we, 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 we sit around and talk with them a little bit on the field before they go in. And, you know, each and every year, I mean, Mahomes, Kelsey, the whole group, they stay out there. They talk with us all. They'll take a few pictures. And they just love being around it. And again, it's 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 that type of personality, which is the locker room itself. And when you have that going on, it's exactly what you and I experienced with Pitt State is we had that bond. I mean, you and I were an offense, you were a tight end, or we're the third tackle, as you might say it sometimes. Um, but all the same, yeah, many times. you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we we had a great we had a great offense, but our defense was nails. Oh I mean, God. our defense was flat nails, and we had, we had we had great special teams. James Jenkins, Jenkins, and what he was doing with field goals and all that. I mean, we we were together in all facets of the game, and there were there weren't clicks. You naturally gravitate to the people or the offense or the defense or whatever, but there weren't clicks. We all, for lack of a better word, partied after the games, had a good time, met at different people's houses, and it was just um, it was a it, it was a different sort of fraternity. Absolutely. And those guys, in, you know, back to Chiefs a little bit, it looks like they're yeah. having fun. And, yes. and that to me is when everything gels and everything just works beautifully. Because when it doesn't look like work and it just looks right. like it is just effortless, that's when the magic happens. And, and I know with you as a long snapper, I mean, you really, you really, singled out yourself as a professional long snapper because I most people probably don't realize that I think you were the first Pro Bowl selection as a long snapper in 2005. That's That speaks volumes for your skill level. And I know people probably don't realize that you could even spin that ball on field goals and point afters and let the laces land wherever the kicker wanted them, whether it was out, back, whatever. And that saves valuable time for the holder as well as letting that kicker start that movement faster to get that ball off so it's not blocked. And, you know, when you started doing that, I know, I think you said you told me it was Morton Anderson that was kind of asked if you could do that. And then you started really working on that. It was, it was actually it was Anderson. It was actually Gary Anderson. Gary Anderson. Okay. With the Steelers, my, my uh, rookie year. Yeah. Gotcha. So that's when you started working on it with the Steelers. And I'm sure the hours that you put into it just to get mm -hmm. to that level are, are just too many to count. But what were your thoughts going into that when he asked about, can you do that? I mean, did you think you probably never said, no, it can't be done. I'm sure you said, how can I do it? And then just started working well, on it. Well, you're right. And it's interesting you bring that up. You know, you know, what I thought in my mind was you must, what are you smoking? Because what, what is going on here? I've never heard of this before. And, and Gary just recognized that I, I had some skill and he thought maybe, you know, why not ask? And so he did. And apparently I didn't know at the time that this wasn't being done in the NFL. Um, I joke about it now. I always talk about Ace Ventura laces out, Dan. I didn't want the little kicker chasing me around because he thinks I gave him the laces to kick. So um, when he asked me that, what I thought in my mind was, man, they do it at a different level up here. I'm going to have to get on my game. So I said, I've, I've never done that before, Gary, but I'll try. And so I worked uh, on it in training camp in weeks, and I began doing that. And um, if you look at the percentages – the, the field goal percentage of kickers behind me during my career, they generally had their best years when they were behind me. And it was because that they didn't kick the laces, that they didn't see the ball spinning, that that helped, that they had the confidence that the ball was going to be there. And so that's, that's a huge deal. And, you know, you, know you talked about me when I speak to corporations, I use, I use it all the time on my emails, on my text. I, I end up with laces out and, you know, people kind of joke about that. They're curious what it is, but for me, it's facilitating the success of others, helping somebody else be successful. You know, I, I help the holder. He helps the kicker. If he scores points, that helps the team. So ultimately I'm just, just trying to do the best I can. It wasn't until 
I don't know, sometime during my career that I realized that I was kind of the one that helped usher that in. And I think that's another good lesson for us all is sometimes, you know, we have to be open to new ideas that we've never heard of before and realize if it's for the good of the team, for the good of whatever it is that you go after it. And as opposed to thinking I couldn't, I never thought that I wouldn't be able to figure it out. It just seemed like it was possible. You know, I, I joke now about also because I know the ball rotates three and a half revolutions in those eight seconds or those eight yards. The ball, you know, spins about a rate of 600 revolutions per minute, takes about 0.37 seconds to get there. I snap it on a five degree angle. And, you know, right now when I say these things, people look at me like either either number one, you know, long staffing is wildly interesting or more likely I've got too much time on my hands. But what I'm trying to bring up to them is, you know, everything we do in life has these little intricacies to it. I mean, you're a physical therapist. I can't imagine the stuff that you know about the body and everything going on that I have no idea about. And I feel like I'm pretty good, pretty in touch with my body because of what I did. But we all have these things. So, again, I think just being open to it and understanding, because and it wasn't my idea to do that. I just decided if somebody was going to ask, I was going to do my best to, to, to at least acquiesce for a little bit and see if I could, and, and I did. And, and going back, I don't know if that was the right word I just used, but trying to uh, quite honestly help him, and and it did. And, um, you know, I, I kind of got recognized for it, and for whatever reason, and it worked out well. I appreciate the kind words on the – on the Pro Bowl, and and that was a cool cool thing. And you know, I was always in a, a backup offensive lineman. I left Pitt State at about 280 pounds. The heaviest I got in the NFL was 310. So back then, if I if it wasn't bolted down, I was eating it. But um, uh, you know, it's just kind of one of those things. Then that you slim down I, towards I the end. You slim down um, quite a bit towards the end. I did. I think it was year seven. Uh, it was my second year, third year uh, with New Orleans. I wasn't a backup lineman anymore. And at my best day, I might have been below average. So it is it is what it is. But I did play games and, and do some stuff. And I always was on the scout team and helping out in the NFL, too. So I was getting beat up a little bit. Uh, but they got to a certain point where they didn't even want me to be in anything else because they didn't want to take a chance of my hands getting hurt because it had right. become a specialty at this point. So literally during... Uh, that season, I started running extra and I changed my diet. I went from two or from 310 to 275 during the season. And then I lost about 10 pounds a year uh, until I started playing at, at 250. And that's the weight that I played at the rest of my career. Yeah. And that's a big jump in weight from over 300, yeah. uh, which is great. And I'm sure it probably helped your snapping a little bit too, to not have that extra weight um, around the midsection it, when you're bending over to snap that ball. Well, I, I'll admit something to you, Brian. I, when I lost the weight, I knew it would help with football, but I thought it might help my golf game. It did not. Um, but uh, that that was a little bit of a motivation because I used to take golf way too seriously. And I've just given um, up on it. I, so. I, I, oh, I know. It's just my kids are glad I played football for a living because we would have been starving as a pro golfer. Uh, but uh, all, all the same, um, it was it was it was it was it was a big deal, and, and I made that jump and and. Um, it did help me cover a little bit better. I could snap. The snapping didn't change that much, but I could cover better. And I always, you know, kind of joke about the fact, I mean, with the exception of the punter or the kicker, I'm probably the worst athlete on the field at all times. Um, so, you know, I, I may not make tackles, but I consider myself a sheepdog on punt coverage, and I would herd them to, to other players to oh, make I, tackles. I, 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 thought, I, I, thought I saw tackles you were showing. tackles. I know you took a lot <laughs> of there. shots with your head down, but I also saw you make some tackles. Um but, you know, that's just yeah. a testament of being the team player. And back to what you said is being open to new things. And I think that that right. is where most people, especially in organizations and companies, we're all too quick to just be negative and say, right, no, I can't do that or that won't work. And and, yep. and that's that's kind of the cop out or the easy way out because it is it, yeah. it's just like, I don't want to try to do something different. I'm stuck in my ways. And I'm going to stick with this because that's what I know. But sometimes that can take us to another level professionally. It can take us to another level, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's within an organization or whether on a team or with your, with whatever you're doing with your golf game. I mean, just right. trying something yeah. new might just spark that. And I know, you know, you wrote two books after you got out of the NFL. One's, you know, Life's mm -hmm. a Snap and the other one's Game Plan. And some people don't know that you're a, an accomplished author as well, but now they do, so they can go pick up your books. But what motivated you to 
write two books following your career when you were so busy, you know, broadcasting, doing some other things? I mean, what was your motivation besides that after, you know, having a successful 15 year career to now start to write a book about the things that you've done? Right. You know what? I, I think because I started doing a little bit of writing um, and a little bit of, of, of radio and uh, just kind of recognizing uh, a little bit of, of these coaches I'd played for, and they had some pretty wise words to say. And, you know, because I played for Cower, he's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I played for Ditka, he's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I played for Vermeil, uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame. Of course, I, I, I broadcast for Andy Reid. And it got to where I started taking notes, not only on the plays and everything, because I was still a, either a backup offensive lineman or a backup tight end. Um, so I was doing that. But I started taking notes on the motivational things that they were talking about or the team building things they were talking about, because I've just bought, always been in, interested in that. And uh, it kind of became a joke at the end that if, if if the coaches were talking that I was I was feverishly writing things down and they knew it wasn't always the place. Um, and I just knew I wanted to, 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 to do something. I knew it was I wanted to leave maybe a mark. I knew it wasn't going to make me rich or anything, but. Um, I was speaking and, and really in, in the speaking world, the best uh, business card you can have is a book. So I was encouraged to do that. So that's why I did the first one, Life's a Snap. And you know, it was a, a motivational, inspirational, just talking about my time, you know, you know, at Rose Hill High School and, and growing up and some, some tough childhood issues that I dealt with and then going to Pittsburgh State and dealing with that and then going on to the uh, on, on to uh the NFL, the SNAP, uh, is an acronym for set goals, notice strengths, accept accountability, and practice persistence. And that'll be the skeleton of some talks I do sometimes when I'm talking about that side of things. Other times I talk about mindset. Other times I talk about mental health. It kind of d depends. But, again, I just I wanted to do it. I, I finished my first book actually while I was still in the NFL. And then the second one I was still writing. And I finished. I published it just right after I retired. But um, I just felt like – it was something that could go along with my speaking and, and help in, in a different way. And for whatever reason, I, I maybe it's not a good explanation. I just felt like it was something I wanted to do. I think it's great. And, and kudos to you for continuing to try to influence people to do better and be better. I mean, that's just, that speaks volumes of your professional career and just not wanting to just retire and settle, but continue right. to give back and do things. And I think that's fantastic because, you know, we can get really sedentary and do things, but if when you're when you're around greatness, which you know, not too many people have the ability to be around as many Hall of Famers and professional people right. that have really been successful in their craft, and to take those notes and to share those, you know, in a book and with other people, that that's right. just giving other people opportunities to, you know, be a part of some, I guess, motivation and some wisdom that they might otherwise not be. And I think that's, that's right. just fantastic. And, you know, if, if, if you had to pick one skill or habit that you developed or you used year after year to help hone your craft and to help continue you on your path of, you know, broadcasting and then now working with Pittsburgh state, mm -hmm. what would you say that the one skill or habit is that, that you've always kind of gone back to over time that's helped you, right stay motivated and keep moving forward. I think uh, with a doubt, it's just developing that positive mindset and keeping that mindset the best you can. And, you know, the biggest thing we have, Brian, and I know you know this because you're, you're into these things. The biggest thing we have is the power of choice. And we decide what we let in our mind and what we don't let in our mind. And it doesn't mean that it's perfect all the times. We have what they call auto thoughts, the things that just pop in there. But when you're conscious of that, I don't know. If, I'm guessing that you probably do some meditation and things like that. You see, Every day. Like that would be you. Yeah, that's what I thought. And I'm, I meditate as well. And, you know, trying to be at peace with what's going on in my, my mind and, and, and think about one central thing. And invariably I, I go somewhere else, but then I just bring myself back. And I think uh, throughout my career and still now, um, I try to keep that positive mental aspect. I mean, every day when I wake up and I've done this for probably, I started it probably maybe five years ago or so, but every day when I wake up, you know, I, I, I read a little bit. I will meditate in whatever way it is, I, in whatever fashion I do. But uh, but I'll, I, I love quotes. I love positive quotes. And so I'll send a positive quote uh, on, on a group text to 
uh, to my son Blaze, my other son Drake, and then my my future daughter-in-law uh, here in uh, a few weeks, Caitlin. And it's just a positive quote. They don't respond, uh, but I know they see it, and it's something I feel like I can push them. That also they know that I'm thinking about them, and I feel like that's a positive manner because you know, you know, I think the biggest life change you can have is when your kids leave. I know, you know. The, the, it was a, a big thing for me. And so um, having that part of it, but again, just keeping that positive mindset, that can do attitude and not taking the negative side, which I think a lot of people do take. And well, especially I, I try today. to understand that, but I don't. Yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah. You know, we're inundated with all yeah. this negativism and, and I, I basically have, you have to deal with it on a daily basis because you're inundated with social media and all this stuff. And and anymore, right. you don't know what's real or what's not. So we all battle that. And I think we all battle, I would say a little crazy at times and meditation, exercise, those things help keep that in check. Yeah. But also having a good support structure and, you know, Troy and I talked about it in the second podcast, Jim and I talked about it in the first podcast. We're talking about it now, but being able to connect, and we have yeah. that ability to connect now with people. And, and I think that hopefully through this podcast and through people that are listening, mm -hmm. that they will reach out to some of their friends and stay connected. And even if it's, how's it going? doesn't matter. But that's the things that we really need to continue to push just to make sure that we all are staying healthy, but also to look out for one another and make sure if anybody needs something, we can help them out. And I know we've got a good, strong group of guys that do that. Yeah. But that's where we can all kind of reach out and do those things. And, and that really makes the world a better place when we can do that. Yeah. And I mean, I always say, you know, when I'm speaking and, you know, we're human beings as human beings, we're pack animals. We, we want to connect and we want to make a difference in the life of others. That, that, old, that, that, that altruism, I believe is, is how it's said. And I think those are the two things that we're hardwired with. And so when we do that and, and you mentioned it earlier and you mentioned it in the podcast, I think with Troy, you know, talking about movement and how important that is in the exercise. If I don't get my exercise uh, if I go more than a couple of days without getting true exercise, I start to lose it quite honestly. Yeah, I need there. those endorphins. Yeah, I need I, I need the endorphins. I need the stress reliever. And as you said it in the last podcast, movement is life. And it is. And yeah. the minute we stop moving is the minute we start to uh, degenerate a little bit, not only physically, but uh, emotionally and mentally. And, you know, a lot of people don't know I'm 51 percent disabled. And that's by it would have been the, the San Antonio Spurs doc, who's a neutral third party. It was uh, for some benefits for the NFL. But I think a lot of people would be surprised to know that if they see how I work out or how I do, but I do what I'm allowed to do. Uh, I'm not allowed to lift above my head because my shoulders are so bad. It is what it is. I wish I could, but I can't. So I deal with other things. I get, I get my exercise other ways. You know, I'm not supposed to run anymore. I actually don't mind that because I never liked running, uh, but I wouldn't mind doing it every once in a while. But my hips are in such disrepair, but that it just doesn't do well for me. So I, I Peloton, I, I walk and uh, things like that. And uh, again, just making the best of whatever situation you have and understanding that we've got to be happy and grateful in the fact that we wake up every morning and I mean, people, people ask sometimes, what is your first level? Well, my first love was breathing and I'd like to continue it for quite a while. If we don't have our, if we don't have our breath, we, you know, people can go yep. days without water, days without food, but you can only go minutes without air. And that's exactly. the thing that as we get older, you know, I find myself riding my bicycle to work. Um, yeah. Yes. I live very close, which is fortunate, but I can get a few minutes in that way, but it helps me clear my head because just like you said, if I don't get exercise and I don't get some somewhat of an intense exercise, I mean, right. I, I become a bear and I, and I know that's mm -hmm. just because I need that physical, that, that mm -hmm. physical I'm endurance, like or that physical, uh, I don't know if you want to call it contact or just to get that heart rate up mm -hmm. and do something because those endorphins help me move better. And when I, when I, when I don't lift much, which I don't lift heavy anymore, my joints are right. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've got to keep going with that. Cause as we get older, we tend to be yep. more sedentary and, you know, yep. I've always been infatuated with, you know, martial arts and yoga because those cultures, mm -hmm. they, they revolve around movement. And yep. the more we can move our bodies functionally, the better we're going to be over time. And I, and I see that every day in my business with helping people try to move better because 
the, there's no reason for us to not be able to pick ourselves up off the floor or do things as we right. age. We should be able to age gracefully, even though we're hurting and some of our joints and stuff are breaking down, which it's going to happen over time because that happens. Right. But that's, you know, you go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you said earlier, you talked about oxygen, how important that is. And we can't go that long. And there's something I talk about is, is what is your emotional oxygen? Also, also, what are you doing to keep that space between your ears uh, going? And I think that's so very important, but that's, that's kind of what you're talking about also is, is how do you keep moving? Because all those, while those things are physical, they start in the mind with you making the decision that you are going to move. And then what do they say that, that you know, get the body moving and the mind will follow. And, and it's never been more true. I think. Oh, absolutely. The, and the, and the older we get, the more we have to move and it, yes. we don't need to do less. And as much as I love technology, it's also mm -hmm. a crutch that we will find ourselves trapped behind. And I, you know, we numb ourselves. We, yeah. We've got to remove disconnect, you know, Cal Newport's got some, you know, some great books out there on deep work and all of that. And I think those are things that we need to get back to because when we were growing up, we didn't have all this distraction. You right. know, we were outside, we were running, we didn't have all the, the specialty, you know, travel teams and all the, the stuff we right. were playing backyard stuff and we were doing things that way. So I think that we've, you know, we've got to just stay active and keep moving and, and relay that onto our kids and our grandkids when we have those. And, you know, you're going to have a new daughter-in-law here before too long, which is exciting. And I know mm -hmm. you guys just got back from Florida for a nice little bachelor party. So yep. um, I'm sure you're excited to, uh, get blaze married off and there's probably a little bit of sadness as well because you know, one of your boys is growing up quite a bit uh, you have some great kids i've been right, fortunate enough to know them their whole lives and that's yep. been a that's been fun to watch them grow up so i you know yep, you gotta be proud of that enjoy thanks absolutely so now moving forward a little bit after the nfl mm -hmm. after your books now you're with pitt state kind of back home mm -hmm. where you graduated from you know tell us a little bit about how you got back involved with Pittsburgh State after, you know, after your broadcasting career, after your NFL career, and then, you know, giving back to the university, helping them raise funds and, you know, kind of talk a little bit about some of your other passions right now for me so we can, you know, let people yeah. know what you've been up to recently. Absolutely. So um, I retired from football in 06, to kind of took 07 to myself. And in 08, I was asked to join the development team at Pittsburgh State, uh, director of uh, development of uh, intercollegiate athletics and, and basically raising funds, asking for money. And, and, and it made sense. It's my alma mater. And so I have relationships going back to, you know, 1987 on pretty deep relationships, probably to the deepest, uh, almost the deepest that anybody would have at the university at this point in time. But, sure. you know, um, it was great because it, it was going back and being around something that I hadn't been around that much because I'd been in the NFL, so I couldn't get back, even though I would have loved to. And and so it's been fun. And then at a certain point, I was elevated to assistant to the president, special assistant to the president, because it just it took me over um, all the all the colleges and just to help in whatever fashion, not just athletics. And so. That's been fun. You know, certainly there, there's nothing with my name on it uh, at Pittsburgh State, but I have my fingerprints uh, all over a lot of things, which I'm very proud of. And I, and I know what it is. And I, I like that. And nobody else has to know. But, uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be around. And you know Pittsburgh. I mean, in southeast Kansas in general and, and Pitt State. It's just good people and and a good area. And, and they love their university. And, and you and I have a love for it, having, you know, gone there and graduated. But to be able to to help in whatever fashion and organize a giving uh, at this point in time, you know, just roughly, I've helped organize about fifty million in giving, and, and oh, fantastic. Uh, I didn't do that. Uh, it's the people that I went to and I presented opportunities of how could they help, and I literally. I've, I've got multiple people who have given seven figures and the first number is not a one, two or three. And they literally thank me for getting them involved because they feel so much joy in giving back and knowing they're making a difference. And it's folks from Lawrence to, to folks there in Pittsburgh. Uh, and, and some are okay with me saying who they are and some it's a deal breaker. It's like, I'll help as long as you don't tell everybody because I just want it to be anonymous. And that's and it, it's good for both both sides of the equation because you know, some people say, well, I, I don't want my name out there that, I, you know, that's that's just too out there. And I said this to one person. I said, well, you know, I understand that. But um, 
if you put your name on this, some some person may walk by that's going to university and may inspire them to want to be able to give back, back like you did and may inspire them to be more successful in their life, to have the ability to have those those funds to do stuff like that. And when I put it that way, they're like, I had never thought about it that way. And it's the truth. I mean, it can inspire. So it's been fun. Uh, very fortunate. Uh, you know, it's just, um, it's something that I've, I've been blessed to be around for like the, the last you know 17 or so years. Well, and it speaks volumes for the alumni of Pittsburgh State too, to be it able does. to give back right. and, that, and that they still feel attached to the university, which is wonderful. I mean, Gene and I still live here in Pittsburgh and we right. love it here. Um, and, you know, we watch that university grow, especially that technology center, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I just think that's one of the greatest things that Pitt State has going right now is, is all those programs that they have with construction, plastics. You know, it, it's just amazing how that's grown over the years. And I see that being something that's going to continue to grow for them. Yeah, it is. Well, and let's not forget the nursing, which is fantastic oh, yeah. with this, the SIM hospital that just went in. I mean, one of the one of the very few of its kind, which I, I think is amazing. I love the fact that when I'm around places, I talk about the, the tech center, like you mentioned. I talk about plastics. I talk about construction. I talk about nursing. People know Pittsburgh State, and that's a pretty cool deal. Uh, that's, and now the business that, school. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, exactly right. Yeah, with what's going on there. So, uh, that's stuff that doesn't happen at Division II universities. I said it just a little bit ago. Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh State, uh, the way the two work together and, and the way this community is, is something special and is not to be taken granted, for granted for sure. You mentioned some other things I was doing. Um, I still have a three-hour pregame show uh, on the Chiefs, so I do that for 101 The Fox. And then mm -hmm. – I also, I help with uh, War Horses for Veterans. So uh, we actually bring in vets, um, active duty and, and aligned vets, uh, conventional forces and special ops, along with first responders from all over the U.S. Uh, to our ranch here in Stillwell. We've got about 50 acres, about 20 horse, 25 horses, I think it is. Uh, but we come in uh, non-traditional equine therapy uh, f for these first responders and vets that are, you know, basically mental health. They're having a hard time maybe readjusting to society. These folks have been through repeated uh, contact with traumatic events. And so we get in, they work with the horses. I think you probably know to a degree how therapeutic horses are in so many different had, levels. Had them forever. Yeah, they, they were, yo, that's right. I forgot about that. Sorry. They reflect, they, they reflect our feelings. So if you get on a horse in your tents, you know this, but the, to folks, your tents, that horse's tents, you relaxed, you have your breathing controlled. The horse understands also, you know, that when you get close to a horse, they sink their heartbeat to yours. I mean, it's amazing. So we bring in these vets. I have a chance to speak with them. We talk about communication skills breathing skills, meditation, things that, that can help them when they go back. But it's all expenses paid. We fly them in. We fly them out. We have a professional kitchen. We have an indoor arena, outdoor arena. And it's really special. And, and it's it's crazy. I don't get I don't get intimidated speaking ever, except when I speak uh, to the military, because as I tell them, they allowed me to make something as, a, as mundane as playing football central in my life. And so I don't take that for granted. And, you know, I, I speak to Navy SEALs, Green Beret, you know, all the special ops, along with the first responders. And to be able to connect with them a little bit uh, on things and then work with them throughout the week, along with, you know, we have therapists there to speak. We have sessions at night, but they, they clean the stalls. They, they get in the round pen with the horses. Then they learn to ride bareback and then on saddle. Then they learn to rope and then they take a trail ride at the end of the week. And it's just pretty special to be involved with that. It's a really neat deal. How long has that War Horses for Veterans been around? And how did you get involved with it, or yeah. did you start it? No, I did not start it. It's been around for about nine years. Um, Andy and Patricia Brown, uh, they're the founders. Uh, neither one in the military, but they have a deep appreciation for the military. Uh, he had Morgan horses all around the U.S., world champs, and he got into this, <clears throat> and it just kind of developed. Uh, that's a long story, but to what it is now and morphed into it. And, um, you know, I mean, it's the military and, and our, 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 the, the things they do to keep us safe. And it's just hard not to get behind that. And the first responders, both those groups, you know, are running the opposite directions when, when things are going awry. We're running away from it. They're running towards it. And it, it's, it, I, don't, I, don't, 
Yeah, it really is. It, it's it's a pretty cool deal, and um, the military has actually embraced it to where they've actually started paying for flights to bring folks in. We have a pretty long waiting list, believe it or not, and uh, okay. it's, it's just a way to give back. And um, it's right here in, in Stillwell, Kansas, uh, Stillwell, Kansas, of all but places. How did you get involved I, with that? Oh yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. Okay, so um, the founder Andy Brown, I think he had a hip surgery. And so his home health nurse was Billy Darlington, a friend of mine. And I think you, you, you I know, know yeah. So, from Pittsburgh. so she was out there and she, she hounded me for a month. She goes, you got to go out there. This place is what you speak about. I've, I've, you know, I've seen your stuff and uh, I, to be honest, I, I blew it off a little bit because I, I get a lot of requests on some things. And finally, one time she said, Kendall, you going out there or not? I mean, she, she emailed me or something. I said, I apologize. So I went out there. And they're giving me a tour, and they have some Navy SEALs in for that group. They had six of them. And they're giving me a tour of everything. And then they asked me what I speak about, uh, the, the folks that were giving me the tour. And so I told them. And so I see one of the therapists and one of the, 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 the trainers talking, and they come over and like, what you talk about it very, very much dovetails into what we do here and how we do it. Would you ever want to talk to the guys? And I was like, sure, love to. Uh, and so that was on a Thursday and Saturday, I'm speaking to six Navy SEALs and I've spoken to every group since. And I mean, I mean, these are the folks who have been through Kandahar, through Afghanistan. I mean, uh, just, they've been in the thick of it. I, they have to say the least, cause, cause it's for, it's for combat vets. And, and, um, it's just, it's just a really cool thing. Cause these guys, you know, I hear these stories and they'll, they're like Kendall. I mean, this is the first week that I've been able to just concentrate on what's going on. I mean, the horse engrosses me and that's the only thing on my mind. And now I'm not thinking about other things, but you know, they, they come in with their, with their intake forms and they, you know, some of their goals are, I want to be, I want to have a better mental uh, space. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better friend and things like that. And they're having problems because of the PTSD, because of the repeat, repeated traumatic events they've been through and, and, and the issues that they've been afraid to talk about. And I openly talk about my childhood, which was not pretty with abuse and, 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 you know, considering suicide at a, at a time. And this is something that the military is dealing with a lot. And I, I think the fact, yeah, exactly. So I think the fact that I open up about that, they're like, wait a minute, this guy played in the NFL and he has these problems too. And, and we just seem to connect. And obviously what they do is life and death. What I did is I could get hurt on the football field. So it's not the same, but there are a lot of similarities. There's a lot of ways we connect and it's, it's just, it is very rewarding. I think that's fantastic. And that just speaks volume for how you spend some of your extra time. Cause I know you're busy with things with the university and traveling, just trying to right. get us hooked up on a little, a short little um, podcast has been kind of hard with both of our schedules and things like that. Right. But I think that just speaks volumes of how you're still trying to help people and motivate those people to improve their lives from some of the, you know, probably some of the very traumatic events that they've been um, exposed right. to in the military. Yeah. And, you know, we need more of those types of places all around the United States because I'm sure that that place has a limit on how many people yep. it can serve how at a they time. can take in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah we, we try to keep the program small uh, because otherwise things get overlooked. And uh, yourself and anybody listening here, and, and you know, it's kind of our group, you know, people that we played with football wise. So you, anybody listening, if you're ever interested in seeing that out there, just get a hold of me and, and we'll, we'll take oh, you yeah. out there and let you see things. It's a pretty cool deal. I think you would love it. I love it. I, I, a friend of mine, Adam LaRoche up, up north of oh, here yeah. in Fort Scott. Um, mm -hmm. I do a lot of, well, I do some things with him and his ranch and we've done a few things with some veterans and he brings awesome. people in there to get baptized all the time and does some training. Oh, cool. things. And he does a lot yeah. of things as well, which is, you know, hats off to him. I consider mm -hmm. him a close friend and I would love to come up and take you up on that offer sometime yep. just because I would love to see that. How many, how many sessions do they do? Do they do it monthly? Do they do it weekly? Or how, how many how yeah. many veterans are they bringing in at a time? We um, we j we will bring no more than six, and, and we have bunk houses, and they stay there, so they're pe completely engulfed in everything. Uh, but this year we'll do fourteen groups, and you know our goal is as we raise funds that we can hire more staff, and and quite honestly have to get more horses. And you said 
you, you have horses, you know, that's, that's not a cheap thing. Uh, oh, it's yeah. not easy. Uh, there's a lot of things that goes along with that, but we will, we'll take in 14 groups this year. That's bad. So what type of, what time of the year do they do this? Obviously when the weather's nice, they're not doing it in the winter probably. But... No, um, there, there's a few months where we'll, we'll do a couple groups. Uh, but the fact is though, we have an indoor arena as well. That's climate controlled. So if we have weather issues, we can go inside. So we will do some things in November, even occasionally, uh, early December, uh, January and, and, and most of February, at least the first half of February is generally out, but you know, we've done, we've done one group already and we've got another group coming in uh next week so yeah we're we're, we're starting to move along and it's a it, it's, it's just a cool thing we have um i'm sorry i get kind of passionate about this but uh we have we have several world championship cutting horse riders uh who donate their time they they come up from their ranches and, and these are world champs yeah. so they come up from either oklahoma or texas some of them are veterans they love what they do, that they donate their time, they bring their horses up, and they help instruct, and that's a pretty cool deal. One of them is very instrumental in the National Stock Horse Association uh, show that they put on, that they have in Vegas every year. And so they have a separate competition for uh, the War Horses Division. So guys who have learned to ride that have come through our program, they have a cutting horse a competition out there at South Point in Vegas, which is a pretty cool deal. Has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but uh, you got me well, going. So here I go. If, if anybody out there listening is, doesn't know what yeah. a cutting horse is, YouTube it and watch a professional cutting horse rider. You will be amazed at what they can get those horses to do. It's it's impressive to see, and some of those horses are trained. So it's just amazing. It's, it's unreal. It's work of art. Yeah, we uh, we've got one gentleman. He's a twenty seven time uh, national champion, and he's he's bringing horses through his his ranch all the time because he does this. He just literally donated a horse to us recently, who was a world champ, but he's he's since passed his prime. He he. <laughs> The, the horse appraised for, I mean, it was six figures and it, it, I mean, it was just unreal, but you get around this horse and, and, and you'd love it. I mean, it's, uh, her name is Scotch and just, just a complete, I say stud and with her and doesn't go along with it, but all the same, just the, the horse is fantastic. It's just, it's just really cool. I, we just had a little, uh, we just had a little Philly born uh, February 21st. Uh, named Venmo and just so seeing that little filly out there awesome is, is so cool well I just think horses are majestic and I've been around they them are. for you know, my kids had them when they were little and now we're doing little longhorns so we have longhorns oh, out here so wow. we're Very messing cool. with those things but horses to me are majestic they relax you they can mm. do wonders for your mental health and also just yep. as a getaway because yep. as you yep. mentioned earlier you know, you sink your breath. I mean, when you're around a horse, yep. they are, if you're calm, they're calm and they are some of the most amazing animals to be around. And just to watch yep. them move blows me away. I could sit in a pasture and watch a horse just walk around all day long. Um, right. That might sound boring to somebody, but when you see that, that's muscle striations mm -hmm. and you see that movement, to me, there's nothing more enjoyable than seeing a majestic animal just do what they do naturally. Um, right. And that's something fun that's to watch. Cool. So kudos to you for donating your time and helping out with that. Do you ride well, horses you. at all? I do. I, I learned to ride. I mean, since I've been out there, I've learned to ride and, and um, I'm, I'm, I've got a particular one I ride most of the time named uh, uh, Tank, who was donated to us by a gentleman. Uh, long story, I won't get into that, but a guy who's a friend of the program and I just love it. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, I mean, we went on a trail ride and going down some ravines and rocks. I'm just like, oh, I didn't want to go down it myself, let alone on a horse. And I just like, Tank, you're gonna have, you're gonna have to do this because because I ain't got this. And Tank, he, as they said, he finds his footing. It's pretty just cool. Hold on, hold on for the ride. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. I I've enjoyed our conversation so much tonight. Thank you for sharing Absolutely. all that. And is there anything that you want to leave? leave with or tell somebody out there that uh, might motivate them a little bit more than what we've already have tonight? Because I mean, you, you've got so much knowledge, you've been around so many great professional athletes and coaches, you know, for us to keep moving forward has always kind of been, you know, move forward, keep it going, you know, and I love the fact that, you know, just don't always have a negative 
you know, approach to it. Be open to life, be open okay. to suggestions because that allowed you to really blossom your long snapping career into a specialty that now is looked upon as a, really an art form because of how you can control the ball or how people can control the ball. I mean, is there one thing or two things that you want to leave the audience with that uh, some of our yeah. former buddies and it'll be a small audience because we're still tr growing this thing, but um, I've gotten a lot out of this good. conversation tonight and I appreciate it. I agree. Well, I appreciate you as well and, and getting this going um, because it is important for us to continue to band together, certainly as we age and, and, and see s some people leaving us, which is just kind of, kind of hard to, to deal with a little bit. But, um, you know, I think probably the biggest thing is, is something that I talk about all the time with most groups was, is just, you know, the, the mindset that you have, developing your mindset. And that mindset, it's, in, it's important to be in, uh, persistent and to be intentional with it and direct it and understand you have the power of the choice. And, and that comes from what you choose to, to focus on, uh, how committed you, you choose to be and the perspective you take. And if you do those things uh, along with uh, developing connection with those that you're around, I think you always have a chance uh, to do well in your life. And it doesn't mean that you don't have negative thoughts. It doesn't mean that everything's perfect, but things are better when you try to be aware of that and be intentional with that mindset. I agree. And I think we do get our minds sometimes filled with weeds and we need to pluck those weeds so that well, we can have a really nice yard that's plush. Yeah. But, you know, we, there's all the negativism that we can, you know, get in our minds and, and we can perseverate on that thought and it may not be the right thought. So we've got to be able to pluck those weeds out as soon as they get there and do away with it and then just fill well, it in with something good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and my favorite quote by Mark Twain is I've known a great many of troubles, most of which have never happened. Our minds go crazy sometimes. And I come up with scenarios of, of so many different things. When I've had bad things happen in my life uh, in, in, in the last several years, or even during football when I was trying to make a team, then your mind just goes crazy. And, and learning to calm the mind and understand that, that, that most of those never happen. They're just things right. that we conjure up in our mind. And they happen right between our ears and we just exactly need to get right. them out of there. And I, that's exactly. a great, that is probably just worth a million dollars right there in of itself. So... <laughs> Well, you know what? If you can find the person to pay, I'll split it with you. So I'm good to go. <laughs> well, we'll just have to figure that one out here before long. Okay. So, Kendall, thank you so much for being on the My Gorilla pleasure. Mafia podcast. I've yeah. enjoyed this thoroughly. Um, I can't wait to visit with you. And I, I want to get up there to Kansas City because I definitely want to come Absolutely. and tour the War Horses for Veterans Place and maybe even get on a horse myself and have them show me how to ride again absolutely so, and maybe we get some of our other buddies up there for a, a cocktail and see that as well but thank absolutely. you for all that you do for Pitt state thank you for the knowledge that you've passed on to us today and i've really really enjoyed the conversation this evening so thanks for taking time out of your thursday night to visit with me and we'll talk to you again soon thanks kendall thank you